Can the analysis of body language improve performance in competitive sports, both in terms of athlete preparation and in game communication? Uh, yeah, of course. And they do it all the time. My favorite one to watch is basketball when it comes to that. Now, I'm not a person who knows a whole lot about sports. Never was a big sports person, never have been, probably never will be. However, when it comes to communication back and forth and being able to see it clearly, basketball for me. Because baseball is good, but I mean, it's it's like 10 minutes worth of action crammed into two hours, two and a half, three hours. And there's there's not a whole lot of, of communication going on other than the, the catcher doing these things with these little sign language with his hands to the pitcher and the pitcher looking around. That's about it. But when it comes to football, it's a little tougher because they're looking around, but they have to use their whole head, you know. And I'm sure there's things they do where they communicate back and forth as well. But not being into football, I don't know. However, when it comes to basketball, yeah, you can see that. Anybody can see that. There was a thing, uh, Sportsbet, Sportsbet USA. They did a, they had a, they were an app, and you could place bets on the games. And then they did this big promotion, and they hired me and several other people, I think three other people, to um, do a little uh, online talk thing back and forth before the game started. And had a whole lot of people that watched it, and. Our, let's see, they had me, a body language expert, an, uh, an analyst, and then a psychologist, I think, and then this guy, uh, Carlos Boozer, who's a famous uh, basketball player. And we all talked about what we thought we were seeing. And I, early on, picked what I thought would be the winner of the game. And I don't think they want us to pick, say, who do you think is going to win? Just tell us what we're seeing. But I was like, you know what? I think these guys are going to win because I see them talking back and forth. And they won. And they were talking back and forth, but not verbally, but non-verbally. They were they were cueing each other. They were they were uh, it was these head movements, the arm movements, and things that the other team wasn't using as much. They were as well, but not as much. They were just flying off of these guys, but these guys over here it wasn't as much. They were they're a little bit more rigid with their communication than than the other guys. And I'm sure all basketball teams do that. I'm sure they all do that. Like I said, I'm not in tune to all that, but from watching that. I thought that was really interesting. And before the game, they would stand closer together. Not only when they, when they were talking, but just as groups, they would stand much closer to each other. Which, and I don't mean like huddled up, but the the distance between them was a lot less. So I thought that was interesting. That's why I picked them because they sort of stood stood out for me, especially compared to the other team. And uh, there was a famous game. I can't remember the name. Uh, famous playoff. I can't remember what it is, but it's a pretty big deal, you know. Um, but I thought that was fascinating how how you could see them work as a as a group, as all teams do. That's what being a team is about, working as a group, group and and congealing and and you know, you've got a goal and all that. But these guys seem a little bit tighter than the other team to me. So that's why I picked them. So yes, I think uh, body language has a lot to do with um, winning and excelling in sports understanding what everybody else is thinking on your team. How do public speakers use body language to enhance the effectiveness, effectiveness of their presentations and engage their audience? We all that are speakers, we all use body language because when you're talking to a group, you've got to keep their attention and you've got to get your point across. You've got to get your story across. You've got your beginning, your middle, and your end. So you've got to get it up in this like a story arc and then uh, end things and Ta-da! You know, not a big, big blow up or anything, but you've got to to keep them engaged the whole time so they can learn something from you. Some people go out and they'll just they'll talk about things. That's not really a learning experience. But with most of the things I do, a lot of it's healthcare. So I want them to learn stuff. I want to learn how to connect with patients. I want the the doctors to not get sued because you know the doctors get sued out the wazoo all the time. But if you there, I came up with this thing called the patient engagement loop. That's how, um, what happens to a patient when they first go in to see the doctor. You know, if something's, let's say something's wrong with them and they go in and see them, it's like the little, uh, the protocol you go through to see the doctor and then when you leave. And I'd sort of walk you through all those things and tell you the things to look for and how to correct, cre- correct the problems that you may be having with connecting with that patient. Because we know when doctors connect with patients, they touch them on the leg or they, on the way out, they'll, you know, they'll, they'll pat them on the shoulder and tell them everything's going to be fine or tell them whatever the problem is, we're going to get that fixed and give them that look, their their rates of being sued go right in the commode. And, you know, it's really low, really low. My father was a doctor. 
And he never got sued, not once. And I, I asked him about that. I said, how come you remember? Because everybody gets sued in that thing. It's because he said, I treat them like they're, they're people, like they're at our house. If somebody comes over to the house, that's the way I want them to feel, like they know me. I want them to feel like they're comfortable. He said, when they come in to see you, they're scared, man. They're afraid. And they want you to, and, and you're the person there that's supposed to alleviate that and let them know everything's going to be fine. No matter what the problem is, you're going to get it fixed and you'll get to it or you'll address it. Even though sometimes the problem isn't fixable, you've got to walk them through that as well. But you make them feel like they're at the house. They're, they're, they're you know, a guest and that you appreciate them being there. You connect with them because they're, you know, I say people aren't widgets. They're people, you know. So when you're, when, when I'm giving talks to healthcare, that's what fueled all that was growing up seeing that. And you've got to get your, your ideas across to people. So using body language is important because not only do you, just, do you look at people, you don't just look at one person and burn a hole in them staring at them. You've got to look at everybody, but you can't make it look unnatural. You have to do it in a way that people actually feel like you're connecting with them as you're doing that. Because if you don't, they may just tune out. And some people are going to tune out anyway. But a lot of people won't. There'll be you know a bunch of people only that want to learn something from you. That's my thing is is teaching people something, especially in a situation like that. Making sure I get all my points across to get them through the the problems of malpractice suits. So, because um, a lot of uh, great doctors get sued, and it's just because th there wasn't that connection with the patient that that there should have been, or there could have been. Not that there should have been, but there could have been, and that just alleviates that so well when when that's done um, in a certain way. And a lot of doctors are really, and you want somebody who's like into what they're doing. You want somebody who focuses on the studies and somebody who, who's up to date with what's going on. But at the same time, you've got to have that person that can do all that. They've got that nerd up in their head. You've also got to have somebody who can relate to people. That's the most important part because you're dealing with people and their lives and their feelings because they're afraid when they come in. No matter who it is, no matter what's going on, maybe they're going to find something. you got to set them at ease, and there are ways to do that. To, for Not only for the doctor connect, to connect with them, but the receptionist, the the, the nurse or the uh, uh, physician's assistant that walks them back there and you know weighs them and talks to them, takes the initial information, blood pressure, and those kind of things. There are things you can do that will alleviate those malpractice cases and make them virtually go away in most, in most situations. So... That's, I want to get that point across. So I use body language that helps me do that. A lot of, of uh, open-handed gestures, a lot of illustrators, and a lot, you know, you, you never point, you give it one of these, you know, or one of these. I don't do one of these, but, you know, I give it one of those. And I'm, what about you? You know, you can't go, what about you? Because it's sort of, um, it's a little aggressive when you point. But, you know, you get your, your hand like that. I'm getting a little worked up because when I get into that, I get all, I commit. So, yeah, you can use body language and you do it. You you don't want to be marching around the stage back and forth like Chris Rock does on a, on a comedy thing. You want to take your spot there and stand there. And, but you got to move around some because you have to address different parts of the room. But you don't want to be marching back and forth. That's a, you know, it's an amateur thing. But some people can do it and pull it off and it doesn't look amateur at all. You know, especially if, if you have a reason to be doing that, you know. So, know, let's see what the next one is. Why is it hard to tell if someone is mad or tired? Is there a connection between the two, or is it my untrained eye? Well, some people, when, they get, when they're tired, when you wake them up too early, they're just grumpy. Or some people who've been up too late, they just get grumpy. So they have that look on their face. And it's, it's you know, how can you be in a great mood? Some people are, though. I had an aunt like that, always in a great mood. No matter what happened, great mood. No matter what time you got her up, no matter how much sleep she had, man, always in the best mood. So some people are always going to be in the best mood. And then you get some people who are always in the best mood, but if you get them up too early or they haven't had enough sleep, man, they're just grouchy all day. And that's sort of what you expect. I don't know, man, I'm tired. So if somebody says, what's wrong? I think he's tired. Usually that's what the problem is. So... You can tell by how slow somebody moves if they're if they're sitting down like this and their shoulders are down and you know how, you know what being tired looks like, but the expressions they make could just be from not feeling good because they they feel tired. Maybe they're used to being up and running around and doing things, but they're kind of 
stress a little bit. So you see that stress on their face. So their resting face at that point may be a look of anger or a look of, of you know, being mad, you know? So I guess it, it depends on the person. But like I said before, some people are happy when they're tired and it doesn't matter what happens, they're always happy. And some people just get grumpy. Okay. How does the body language of leaders influence morale and productivity of their team? All right. Well, it makes all the difference in the world. Because if you're the leader, let's say you're a CEO. Let's say you're a CEO of a startup. So you're an entrepreneur and you've got, you just started a company. You're the one that's supposed to set the tone for, the, for everybody in there. You're the one that sets up the culture. You're the one that says, we don't act like this. We act like this. We see things this way when it comes to our business. That's the way we handle business, the way we do things. So if you're in a, a grouchy mood all the time, that's not going to be good for your company or your, you know, your people that work for you in your startup. Not at all. There's a fellow at the uh, Nashville Entrepreneur Center, Michael Burcham. He was the CEO there when I first got there. He's the guy that brought me on as the entrepreneur in residence. And I think it was two years in, there was some really uh, something bad had happened. And it was... Um, and it should have affected everybody there to be like, oh, we're all bummed out and this kind of thing. It it was it passed and everything was fine. But he never looked like it, anything bothered him at all. And when that subject about that came up, it was just like it was nothing. He would discuss it like you were asking what I was going to have for lunch, you know. And he seemed positive about it all. So I got him went in his office. Always had he's one of those guys always had his door open so anybody could go in. So I'd always go in. I said, hey, listen, let me ask you something. This problem here, it's pretty bad. And everybody's pretty down about it. What, how you, what's going on here? Why aren't you down about it or whatever? Because he said, because I'm, I'm the one in charge. I'm the leader. I'm the CEO. And that's the way you do it. He said, we're going to get past this. And they can't see it, but I can. And I'm showing that I know that. So they'll have confidence in me. And they'll have confidence in this place, in the Entrepreneur Center. And I, I thought that was fascinating, you know, because it was true. And... He understood how, how to be a leader, understands how to be a leader. And that's how you do it. You show you're the one in charge and you're the one that knows what's going to happen next. And if you can't figure out what's going to happen next, next, that's okay too. Because you'll get through it if it's good and you'll get through it if it's bad. Whatever it is, you'll do it and you'll move on from there. That's that's what leaders are about. That's what leadership is. When something's going bad and you still got somebody going, yeah, it doesn't matter, we're going to do this. Here's what we're doing. We're staying and doing this. And he could pull that off. So that's the key to, to using body language, and that is to show all the, the body language of confidence. And he never looked down. He never looked sad. Never looked like something bothered him. He always looked like, hey, this is the place to be, man. This is it. You know, so I thought it was too. Everybody thought it was. And it was. It was awesome. And when, the, when leadership like that leaves and everything changes, he left. And not long after that, I left. You know, he, he went on to do something else. He's like a company or something, started another one. And uh, that when leadership changed, that person didn't have that. And then a couple of leaders after that, once I had left, they had a couple of others that still hadn't been able to pull, weren't able to pull that off. But there wasn't that charismatic leader for that place, which was kind of a bummer, you know. But it was such a, it made you, and he made you feel like what you were doing was important. That's the main thing. Always made you feel like, yeah, we're doing something here. This is great. We're helping these entrepreneurs, and so I was committed. I was like, yeah, I, I love being there because it was it was wonderful when we do that. I mean, I, I would was doing a lot of the things too, but when I was there, it was great because he was such a great uh, leader. Learned a lot from him. A famous quote says, "Half wits talk a lot, but say very little." Does this apply to body language? Yeah, that's a great question, and it's true. Yeah, you know, a lot of times when when you'll see someone show you too much body language, especially in interrogations, and you've seen them all online, you've seen them on the behavior panel. Sometimes when you first go in to talk to somebody, and everybody's pretty sure they did it, and you can go in with a you know, confrontational beginning. You can you can confront them with it when you first go in. Okay, and I won't use any bad language on this, but I'll I'll get I'll get as close as I can without cussing. And you'll come in and you'll say. Or I'll say, listen, we know you did this. They know you did this. There's no question about that you did this. Let's talk about what happened. I want to know what happened. Let's talk about that. And they'll go, I didn't do this, and I got all this and that and the other thing. And they'll use some explicatives. And you'll and you you sit there and listen to it for a couple minutes. 
And after a little while, that anger settles down a little bit and they'll start talking almost normally, right? <clears throat> That's usually the person who's guilty, who did it. You can't tell from that every time. You can't because you've got to take all these other things into consideration. But quite often, the one who settles down fairly quickly from all that, this anger, this explosive anger, you, you, you got a lot of talking to do this person. Now, when you come in and you say the same thing, hey, listen, they know you did this. I'm under the impression you did this as well from all the evidence we have or they have about this. I want to find out what happened. Let's talk about this. Me and you need to get down and, and talk to and get to the specifics of what's going on here. Won't you tell me what happened? And they'll get mad and they'll explode, but they'll stay mad and they'll stay mad and they'll stay. And you can't hardly get them calmed down, especially if somebody that didn't have anything to do with it. And you got their own person, like big time of their own person. Man, it's hard to get them settled down because they'll keep getting and they'll settle down for a second. And then they'll ramp back up and get all mad. So, but it doesn't mean they're innocent. It doesn't mean they didn't do it, but that's one of the things you look for. It's like anything else. It's a cue. So you still have to go through that process and protocol that you have to, to follow and go through to make dang sure that person isn't the person that stole something or, or whatever their thing is or whatever they did. So, but that's one thing you look for is, is that the body language that, that is uh, sincere and you keep seeing the same thing every time. When they when they start settling down, or they start get, when they start getting angry again, because they'll get mad if you keep accusing them. Not like that, but if you keep saying you're there, no, I didn't. I'm telling you, I didn't. That'll go away just briefly, but then it'll come right back. So those things are specific. But if the person, like I was saying earlier, they get really big and they get really angry at first, and the the anger is too big. So going back to your question, it's just it's just too big and too much, and it settles down too quickly. So yeah, you can, they can, there are situations in body language where you do too much, you know, sometimes you see someone who's too nice, you know, like the, you go to a party or something or go to wherever you're going and the person's just too nice and they're doing too many things that let you know they're, that they're trying, I don't know, it, it just seems like too much. You'll see that too. It's way too much smiling, way too much, oh, way too much of the, you know, they just told me that whatever. And it's just too much. You know, so that's one of those situations where the body language is too much, like the, the half with it talks too much but doesn't say anything. Same thing with, with those in body language. When somebody's just it's just too much sometimes, too nice. Mm. Nothing wrong with being too nice. Everybody likes nice people. I do, you know. But when they're, it's too much and you can see it's fake. Oof. What event in life created your fascination with psychopathy? I know what it was. When we lived in Louisa, Kentucky, there was this woman, an old woman, who lived on our street. And I think her name was Miss Carter, was what her name was. And she had a boyfriend. She was an older woman. I don't know how much, how older, older was, because I was probably nine at the time, you know, seven, eight or nine, something like that. And her, her boyfriend shot her, you know. And I couldn't understand why somebody would do that. I couldn't, I it was a really tiny little town, but that was the only doctor there for a while. And I couldn't understand why this guy would do that to that woman. I, I couldn't wrap my head around. I was like, why do you do that? And it wasn't like, well, people just do that. So my dad said, his brain isn't like your brain. His brain isn't like my brain. His brain isn't like these other people's brain. Because he, he doesn't have, he cannot feel what other people feel. Empathy. And he didn't say empathy because I wouldn't understand it. And I said, well, and I was like, what does that mean? He said, like, if you, if I was to to break my finger, he wouldn't go, ooh, I bet that hurts. He would see my finger broken. He may have sent sympathy for me and feel sorry for me, but his brain isn't set up to feel, to imagine what that feels like. He can't imagine what it feels like to have your finger broken unless his is broken. He cannot, he can't feel that for you. He can't feel sorry for you. And not only that, there are other things that he can't feel. So that's, and, and that's part of the, the person that will do something like that. They can't, they don't have the same kind of feelings that mean you have. His brain doesn't work like your brain or my brain. He was trying to explain why the amygdala in this person wasn't functioning. It wasn't working properly because it, as it come to find out he he was uh well I'm under the impression now that he was a psychopath because he'd done some really horrible things in the past as well to to people animals and things like that and he was trying to explain that to me in a child's version 
which I think has affected me in training and why I like to, to train and do things because I can I can see things from that point of view, having begun learning about those things from that point of view, having explained so simply. Because if you can't explain what you're talking about to a to like an eight-year-old, hey, you know what you're talking about. You can't explain it. To, you're not, you know, you're not, you're not at that point yet where you should be out telling people about it. For example, Einstein, for example, um, he said, well, you have the special theory of relativity, right? And that is, um, as an as an object approaches the speed of light, the energy of motion is converted into mass. As tough as that sounds, and as big of a, of a statement as that is, as a theory of that is, and you've you've seen the big thick books and the papers and all that stuff on that, right? Well, you can say that a lot smaller, a lot easier for a little child to understand. You can say, and in a nutshell, this is it. You can say, instead of saying all that, you can say, the faster something goes, the heavier it gets. The faster something goes, the heavier it gets. Instead of just having all that stuff. And Einstein got all that information down on this little one inch equation, E equals MC squared. Brilliant. The guy was brilliant. We know it was Einstein. But that shows you how you can take something that's complicated and bust it down into something that's really understandable, even to a child. So that's why I think I'm into it, because I understood it as a child and could think about it as I got older. And I could add things to it as I as I read things or learned things in science and all that, you know. Oh, the brain, okay. Here's what I know about the brain. Some of them aren't. Some people have different brains than other people's, as far as feelings go, how they feel toward people. And so I would look for those things to, to add to my information about that. I guess that's that's that must be the root of all that was that early explanation of it, or him trying to 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 explain to me how it worked or what the problem was with that guy. So I think that would be it. I would think. How does body language contribute to first impressions and? What strategies strategies and individuals use to ensure their positive to ensure positive outcomes? That's a great question. And we actually talked about that on the video before this one. I think it's the one right before this one. So go look at that. It's the instant instantaneous impressions study. So go check that out, because we've already talked about this before and it'll be boring. But go look at that. It's I think it's in the very last video. Uh, what are the challenges and benefits of teaching body language awareness to professionals in, in customer service roles? Well, if somebody's got a problem, what you want to do is let them know. It's like being a doctor, like we were talking about earlier. You want them to know you understand that and you you feel for them. That's why they're calling up. I got a problem. Hey, man, I've got a problem. Or if they come to your office or whatever. And you have to let them know you see that problem, and you have to be empathetic toward that. And there are ways to show you're empathetic. You know, you can, you can sort of tilt your head to the size you listen and get that concern in your brow. Not too much where it's like, oh, yeah, because then they'll know you're mocking them or they'll think you're mocking them. So you got you to do it just right, or you can do it like this, you know, oof, gosh, I know that's horrible. And you tell them, I'm so sorry about that. That's horrible. I know you're frustrated. So you have to show them you're being empathetic. But you have to look like you're listening when they're talking to you too. If it's not on the phone, let's say if it's if this, if it's in person, you have to look like you're listening and look like you care. And to look like you're listening, get those eyebrows up like that. You get your ear this way, and you do this a little bit as they're talking. And when it comes to the bad part, of course, you start to ooh, uh, I'm so sorry about that. I know how you. Been. So you have to say you're sorry, which you should be if you're in customer service. That's your thing. Some people I've met in, the, in customer service, I've talked to them, man, they're just mean. I guess they're tired of it. It gets old after a while. I don't know. I've never had to do that. But the people I've really dealt with that were great at it, sounds like I was the first person they talked to that day. And I know I wasn't because I was on hold for a while before they got there. You know, So it's, it's an art. You got to be good at it. But you can use body language to help diffuse those big things. We talked about um, de-escalating situations where someone is, is all riled up and getting fired up. It's almost the same kind of thing where somebody comes in, they're really, really upset. And the main thing to do when somebody's upset, zip it. Don't say anything. Just listen empathetically. And you can't listen empathetically without letting them know you're being empathetic. It's like we talked about a couple of seconds ago. You have to look like you're understanding them, like you're listening to them, and that you get it, and you're so sorry that that happened to them. That kind of thing. I've noticed some people blink their eyes asymmetrically. One will close, uh, one will close and open, following the other. 
So I guess they're talking about that happening instead of this happening. Talking about that happening, or I don't know how to do it. That happening, you know, one closes and goes like that. Um, <clears throat> that could be a neurological situation. Most likely, nothing's wrong. Most of some people is like that, but you do need to keep an eye on that. If you notice somebody doing that that hasn't done it before, then you you should you should address that. Um, I know somebody who has this thing called uh, supernuclear palsy, and one of the ways they discovered it because I know this person very well. And I noticed them blinking odd when we were eating one time. And I told my dad, I said, hey, something's up here. The blinking isn't, isn't in sync. Something's not, or they're, they're not in sync together. And uh, a supernuclear palsy is like the ALS version of Parkinson's. So come to find out that's what this person had. And it took a while for it to, to uh you know, to happen and to get it diagnosed and all that. But that was one of the first signs of that asymmetric blinking thing happening. So pay attention to that. But if it's something they do all the time, I've done it for years, no, you know, I don't know. I wouldn't, I wouldn't worry much about it because the people is like that. And we all do it every now and then. You know, when you slow video down, you watch somebody, you'll see, you'll see that happen sometimes, especially if there's something on their mind and they're explaining something or they're stressed, you'll see that happen. So don't freak out if somebody you know is doing it. But if you've never seen it on before and it's happening a lot and their blink rate slows, their their shutter speed of their eyes slows down as it happens, you know, I would suggest talking to them about it and maybe getting to talk to somebody about that. You know, go to the doctor or to a neurologist or something, say, hey, here's what someone noticed. I don't notice anything different. And you'll get a little a run of some uh, neuro neurological test on you and see what's up. If anything is, may not be anything up. Probably not, you know. But this is something to pay attention to. Good question, actually. I seriously worry that I would be busted if I was ever interrogated for anything. I do all the guilty things during conversations and, and can't seem to help it. Maybe I should be quieter. I twitch, wiggle, fidget, giggle, and the worst case, nervous laughter I've ever had. Can you tell the difference? You have absolutely nothing to worry about when it comes to being, if you ever got in trouble for something or being interrogated and you start that stuff, you can see through that really, really quickly. And after a few minutes, believe it or not, that's going to go away, especially if you're focused on something, you're talking to someone about yourself. You may keep doing those things, but you can see right through them. I promise you, you can. Don't you worry about that one second. Don't you worry about that because a professional can see right through that and understands what's happening. That's part of it. That's part of the game. When you go and you look for those things right away. So don't sit around and fret that. Anybody watching this thing, I hope I never get in trouble, never get interrogated. Don't worry about it. They'll be able to see right through that. Believe me, I, I promise you, don't worry about that. Not even a little bit. All right. What is vocal fry? I've watched the behavior panel for years and I cannot hear it. Uh, well, vocal fry, as well as it's, it's almost like, um, um, when you start hanging out with people and you really like them and you start growing close with them or it's somebody that you, you really like for a long time, you're finally getting out to hang out with them, you start taking on their mannerisms and their speech patterns as well. And it's almost like a little, like we've talked about before, like a little uh, language virus. It's almost like that. You know, notice at Starbucks, sometimes you go in and they talk like this. It's when your voice goes like this. You know, you hear, uh, what's her name, uh, Meghan Markle do it all the time, the way your voice, it sounds kind of gravelly when you do that. <clears throat> I've got a gravelly voice. I got, I've got. i talked about before all the singing, the bazillion background vocals I've done on the records I've done. It's, it's made my voice sound this way. And some people, um, they talk like that because they think it sounds cool. And they'll, they'll also have these weird lilts in their voice. And they do it, and they always sound like they're telling you something that's really smart and that they know, and that's when it starts happening. So it's that little gravelly thing. That's what vocal fry is. It's that little gravelly sound that comes out of, out of somebody when they're when they're talking from their depth. You know, usually it's somebody who's on the impression they've got the depth that you need a donkey ride to the bottom of just to get to the bottom of their depth, you know. But they're usually not very, not much there, obviously. So... But you do you do hear that a lot in 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 uh, especially with younger people. I don't mean I'm not hitting I'm not you know smashing star Starbucks or anything. I'm I'm just trying to be funny there. But you know, hearing younger people most of the time when they're talking about whatever it is, and she told me 
Yeah, it gets on my last nerve. I can't stand it. But it sounds like I'm doing a lot because of my voice, the way it is. So maybe I am doing vocal. Well, I'm not because it's that's a whole it's its own thing. But my voice sounds like that a lot. And some people's voices probably sound like that and they're not doing it. But listen to what they're saying when they're doing it. There you go. Okay, have you ever been, a situ been in a situation where you knew someone was telling the truth even though everyone else thought they were lying? Yeah, quite often. And everybody thinks they're not telling the truth. And I always say, looks to me like, or in my opinion, this person is, what they're saying is true. In other words, it could be, anything. I remember one time we were in a studio and, and something was stolen. And this guy was telling everybody, I didn't steal it. And they all had decided he had stolen it for whatever reason. And I came in. And I, and I said, what's going on? They said, oh, this guy stole so-and-so and so-and-so. And, -so and he said, I'm telling you, I didn't do it. He kept talking about how he wouldn't, didn't do it, and he wouldn't shut up, right? So I just sat there and watched him for a while. Then, then I, you know, I always say, ask someone a question, and then wait, stop. And the person who's a lot of times guilty or the person who's lying to you, they'll start adding qualifiers to that answer, to make it sound even more believable, you know? So I said, so did you do that? And he said, no, I didn't do it. I'm not, I don't steal. I'm not that guy. I don't do that. And I waited. He waited. And I waited. He said, what? And I just kept looking at him. And he said, I didn't do it. And kept going on with the I didn't do it thing. Didn't add any qualifiers. Didn't do squat, right? Come to find, and I told these people, I said, this guy didn't do this. And showed none of the cues and, and things that showed he was being deceptive or possibly being possibly being deceptive. I said, this guy didn't do it, I'm telling you. I know for a fact, I, I put it all on this guy. He didn't, he didn't steal anything. Boy, they really thought he did. <laughs> the girl who was like, thought her, this thing had been stolen, she opens up the bottom drawer and there it is. She didn't say anything when she opened the drawer either. When she did... Somebody saw it. Well, there it is. <laughs> and she was shutting it. Oh, man. And I, I was like, I didn't say, see, I told you. I just went, there you go.